Four years ago, Coach Marv Levy inherited the 2-12 and 12 Kansas City Chiefs, and the league's newest coach made a vow that he would make the Chiefs winners once again. Levy's optimism was drowned by a tidal wave of frustration. The Chiefs finished 1978 with a disappointing 4-12 and 12 record, but Levy became more determined to guide the Chiefs out of the darkness of the AFC West cellar. In two years' time, Kansas City became a 500 ball club, and when they rolled into Pittsburgh for this year's season opener, the Chiefs were ready to challenge pro football's upper ranks. But in order to reach the light at the end of the tunnel, Kansas City had to beat the team of the decade. For nine out of ten years, Three Rivers Stadium has been a graveyard for visiting teams on opening day. But as 50,000 fans readied the gallows, the Chiefs were planning to cheat the hangman. Bill Kenny takes and he straight back, sets up, looking left, throws to the left side, he's got Marshall with the 25, he'll go all the way. 15, 10, 5, touchdown! A quick Kansas City score provoked Pittsburgh to retaliate as the Chiefs and the Steelers engaged in one of 1981's most exciting games. When the game moved into its later moments, the Steelers began to assume command. Sparked by the kind of plays that led them to four world championships, the veteran Steelers drew a step ahead of the younger Chiefs. With a 33-30 score resting in their favor, Pittsburgh zeroed in on an opening day victory with wide-eyed confidence. But with one blink of the eye, Steeler hopes vanished. Bradshaw has him down at set. Bradshaw takes, bubbles the snap, it's loose, picked up on the play by the Chiefs, rolling out in front of the field is Thomas Howard, and he will go all the way. Thomas Howard, a 10-5 touchdown, Kansas City. I've never seen anything like this. 19 years of broadcasting Cape football, this has been number one. In a single play, the Chiefs concluded one era and commenced another. No longer were these Chiefs content being the sparring partner for the NFL heavyweights as they proved to themselves that they too were legitimate contenders. By stealing the NFL limelight on opening day, there was no doubt that in 1981, these Chiefs were coming on strong. Leadership. It is the one indispensable trait that no team can teach or live without if it wishes to become a winner. Fortunately, the Chiefs have plenty of it, and there is no finer example than safety Gary Barbaro. The old man of the Chiefs' defense in his sixth season, Barbaro was the glue that kept the secondary together by making the big plays en route to his second consecutive Pro Bowl. Joining Barbaro was another Pro Bowl defensive back, number 24, Gary Green. Together, Green and Barbaro were among the AFC's most tenacious tandems, and those teams who dared to throw in their direction paid dearly. Barbaro and Green headed the list of five Chiefs that made the Pro Bowl, and their example helped to galvanize the Kansas City defense into one of the league's fiercest units. Each 
each week. Opposing teams were jolted by a defense which allowed the fewest rushing yards in the AFC. A major factor in Kansas City's ground domination was defensive end Art Still, who fought off nagging injuries and pesty blockers to get his man. Still was an all-conference selection for the second time in his four-year career, and he pressured other teams to divert their attention to other parts of the field. When they did, these teams ran into other defensive linemen like Don Parrish, Dave Lindstrom, and improving nose tackle Ken Kramer, number 91, who led the team in sacks. Behind the line stood number 59, Gary Spaney, the enforcer in the Chiefs defense who for the fourth consecutive year led the team in tackles. Spaney, along with Thomas Howard and number 53, Whitney Paul, was one of three Chiefs linebackers who, incredibly, returned fumbles for touchdowns. Kansas City's opportunistic brand of defense quickly became recognized throughout the league. Teams grew increasingly wary of this gang of street fighters who wouldn't give an inch nor back down from a challenge. Such a challenge rolled into Kansas City on week six when the Chiefs encountered the Oakland Raiders. The Chiefs made sure the reigning world champs did not leave Arrowhead Stadium unscathed. Seemingly, each time the Raiders took to the air, there was a chief defender ready to intercept the ball. By thwarting Oakland's passing game, Kansas City went on to blank their AFC Western rivals 27 to nothing. Big keys in tying up offenses like the Raiders were linebackers Charles Jackson and number 99, defensive end, Mike Bell. Bell sat out last season with an injury, but made his presence known in 1981 by earning the accolade as the Chiefs' comeback player of the year. Like Bell, the Chiefs proved they could come back from adversity as well. In a rematch against the Raiders in Oakland, three first-half Raider interceptions led to scores, and the Chiefs trailed 17 to nothing by halftime. However, the Chiefs refused to accept defeat. Scrambling Steve Fuller came off the bench to provide the offensive spark while running back Billy Jackson scored three times to thrust the Chiefs into a 21-17 lead. The sudden turnaround left the Raiders bewildered. It was pro football's most celebrated rivalry at its best as Oakland staged the last-minute comeback and came to the threshold of scoring the winning touchdown. But like an unwelcomed guest, the Raiders had the door slammed in their face. Mark Wilson has brought the Raiders back. Second and goal at the two-and-a-half-yard line. Making the handoff back to the row. Wilson, he's hit the football. Pops loose and rolling loose. Has been recovered by the Chiefs. Down the left sideline. On the run, Gary Spaney across the 50. He may go all the way. The Chiefs defeat the Raiders and come from behind fashion and now lead the AFC West Division with a 6-2 record. With the Chiefs soaring to the top of the AFC West, crowds of more than 70,000 fans streamed into Arrowhead to take part in Kansas City's resurgence. But even the most supportive Chiefs fan 
knew much of the credit rested with the defense, and it was time for the offense to emerge. season, the Chiefs offense recorded more first downs and more total yards in more exciting ways than any team in Kansas City history. The thrust behind this offensive firepower was generated by the Chiefs quarterbacks. Number nine, Bill Kenny, strong-armed the Chiefs to key victories by delivering bona fide game breakers. Sharing the starting duties with Kenny was former Rhodes Scholar candidate Steve Fuller. In 1982, neither Kenny nor Fuller will enjoy the luxury of youth and inexperience, as the Chiefs will be depending on a steady number one quarterback. But there's little doubt that either man can call the big play. Kansas City was thought of as just a running team. Yet Kansas City responded with their most proficient passing offense since 1976. When they went to the air, the Chiefs mainly looked for number 89, Henry Marshall. Marshall was the Chiefs' daring acrobat who finished the season with 16 yards per reception. Equally effective was tight end Al Dixon, who won a fiercely competitive starting job by recording his finest pro season ever. Also enjoying his best year ever was number 86, J.T. Smith, whose 63 receptions was the third highest total in team history. Smith also continued to etch his name into the team record book by doubling as a superb punt returner and remained the only chief to handle a punt in three years. Along with Captain Ed Beckman, Dave Klug, Todd Thomas, Phil Kansig, and Curtis Bledsoe, Smith and the Chiefs' unheralded special teams proved again and again how important they were to the winning cause. However, the special teams were not the only group hidden in obscurity. Rudney, Condon, Herkenhoff, Buddy, and Getty. They were the men in the trenches who paved wide glide paths for the Chiefs' conference-leading ground game. The line did their jobs. No AFC team could run the ball better than Kansas City. Only the Detroit Lions and the Dallas Cowboys gained more yards on the ground than the Chiefs. Early in the season, the Chiefs' best rusher was gutsy Ted McKnight, who often ran over defenders when he couldn't go around them. McKnight's aggressive style was complemented by pile-driving fullback James Hadnot, who got tougher as the field got shorter. Both Hadnot and McKnight had their moments of brilliance, but it was rookie Joe Delaney who wrote the season's most spectacular chapter. Against Houston, 
Even the stingy Oiler defense could not deny Delaney of a record 193-yard rushing day, a season high among all NFL running backs. After Delaney rocketed the Chiefs to victory, Houston's perennial All-Pro Elvin Bethay commented, I played against the best, O.J. Simpson, Sears, and Payton, and Delaney's right up there. More than anyone else, Delaney was leading the Chiefs on a contender's trail. In this new Chiefs era, Kansas City has dedicated itself to reshaping the team with raw young talent. This grassroots approach reaped dividends a year ago when the Chiefs strengthened their kicking game with Nick Lowry. This season, Lowry was voted the AFC's finest kicker, and in front of his Pro Bowl peers, he kicked the game's winning field goal. Another individual who had a brilliant sophomore season was cornerback Eric Harris who for the second year led the team with seven interceptions. However, not since 1963 had the Chiefs enjoyed such a splendid draft as they did in 1981. First round pick Willie Scott, number 81, and Marvin Harvey could wind up changing the tight end position from one of the team's weakest areas into one of the strongest. These two rookies will provide a big challenge for veteran Al Dixon for the starting assignment this coming season. Another position which gained strength was at strong safety, where the Chiefs found number 34, Lloyd Burris. Burris won the Mack Lee Hill Award as the team's most spirited rookie, an honor also achieved by Kansas City's other three starting defensive backs. Touchdown honors were achieved by number 43, Billy Jackson, who crossed the goal line 11 times and demonstrated why the legendary Bear Bryant called Jackson one of the best all-around backs he ever coached. But while Jackson came out of football-proud Alabama, the Chiefs' greatest find in 1981 grew up on a Bayou dairy farm. When Joe Delaney was drafted, many observers wondered if the 5-foot, 10-inch running back could survive NFL defenses. Once he got his hands on the ball, Delaney dispelled all doubts. Delaney earned the Chiefs' Most Valuable Player Award and won the hearts of his teammates and fans by destroying the rushing records established more than a decade ago by Mike Garrett. was Kansas City's prized pupil of this talented freshman class. A class which stole the spotlight in a Week 12 encounter with the Seahawks. rookies contributed toward Kansas City scores as the Chiefs drubbed Seattle 40 to 13. The win extended their record to 8 and 4 and the Chiefs were floating on the dream of football in January. But then the bubble burst.
Injuries and costly turnovers took their toll, and Kansas City fell to defeat in three consecutive games. An unfulfilled playoff dream left the Chiefs glassy-eyed and dazed. With playoff hopes finished, the Chiefs faced the Vikings on the season's final Sunday to close the curtain on nostalgic Metropolitan Stadium. The Chiefs had just one goal in mind, to finish 1981 a winner. Fuller straight back. Fuller has protection. Now steps up. Rolling left. Throws the left side of the end zone. And a touchdown! Stand roll! The Chiefs fought the bitter cold and held the NFC's most potent passing attack to half its average output. Kansas City held a four-point margin into the game's final minutes. But Minnesota's Tommy Kramer scratched and clawed the Vikings back into contention. With his team a whisper away from the end zone, once again, everything rested upon the Chiefs' goal line stand. On the three-yard line, Minnesota, fourth down and goal to go. Tommy Kramer drops straight back, looking the end zone. He throws the right side. It's batted away and complete. As they had done all season long, the Chiefs persisted under pressure. And for the first time since 1973, the 9-7 Chiefs could call themselves winners. In 1981, there was a feeling that this victory celebration was just beginning. For these Kansas City Chiefs are coming on strong. <laughs>